Yes. Excellent. So, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Good I'm morning. going to introduce you as um, I've been reading your LinkedIn profile. So I thought, actually, you know what, rather than rely on a faulty memory, I'm just going to read out. Mark is a hospital consultant, palliative medicine in tertiary cancer centre and a university hospital board. Um, and he's a professor of Cardiff University School of Medicine, BMA, BMJ clinical teacher of the year speaker at Hayfest, Edinburgh Fringe, and Creative Talk CPR, amongst other things. I mean, what a, I mean, what an intro. <laughs> LinkedIn have... profile needs changing. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to add things? You know, long as your arm. Fair play. <laughs> <laughs> so very glad to have you here today, Mark, and uh, thank, thank you, you for coming. And obviously we, we catch up periodically about various things. So yeah. today is about having a chat, seeing what's going on in your world of uh, I don't like the words frontline, but, you know, I think it's fairly um, appropriate in certain uh, circumstances, medicine, as opposed to us who get to sit in the background and, you know, pontificate for hours on end and uh, enjoy the experience of, well, maybe, maybe we could do this. Whereas, you know, I always think that you're, you're having to make decisions much quicker. Yeah. No, so. great, great to be here. And, and thanks for, for arranging this as well and, and, and making me part of this. It's, um, you know, it's great to, to meet people from all sorts of walks of life from different professions as well. And, you know, um, been, been always very helpful having, having you kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I called you once just randomly from Flandock Hospital with a, a specific query and uh, you were just there and you were able to answer it bang on right perfect and uh, we we carried on I don't know if you remember that one but uh... Uh, yeah and I, th I think that that's what's nice isn't it I think you know it is nice having that sort of different perspectives and actually just that safe pair you know actually can I just phone a friend yeah yeah exactly yeah. um and it's great stuff and you know and I know you've done the same for me because uh, you know sort of before we started we were talking about you know sort of uh you know my health anybody who knows me i've been through uh, cancer this year and um you know i'm fine i'm all right don't worry <laughs> but it was great actually have listening to somebody who's actually a, med a medic going it's fine it's really quite practical it's all sorted yeah. nhs is just will do their thing <laughs> i have to, I have to make, make sure that as a palliative care doctor i don't go into sort of head tilt mode oh are you okay Helen? <laughs> uh, <Yes. you> know. <laughs> So yeah, actually, that's a really good point. Could you explain for those of us, you know, in the room, palliative care? I mean, it's it, it's it's a big word, big big yeah. area. What, yeah. what what is palliative care? You know, what does that look like in in reality? So, yeah, no, absolutely, and I have to explain this most weeks. In fact, this is my my office here, so I'll pan this round a little bit, basically, and you can see a little blackboard at the back there, which I've put up there because. Essentially, I've got medical students here most weeks on a Tuesday, okay. and they kind of need a bit of a definition of palliative care. And um, I'll just read it out very quickly. The sort of def ah, this brilliant. is our team definition. So there's a World Health Organization definition, which is pages long. Uh, so we've come up with a, short, a shorter one, which is still two sentences. But uh, so palliative care is a multi-professional therapeutic approach for all populations with life limiting and life threatening illnesses. The goal is to um, I should put my glasses on is to prevent actively address any suffering symptoms and serious illness burden, often from the time of diagnosis onward. OK, so yeah, medical students often come in and say, oh, surely palliative care is just about the last two weeks of life. And I say, well, actually, no, I work in a cancer hospital here and I work in a general hospital. Sometimes we get a referral to work with a team of surgeons or oncologists from the time of diagnosis onward. Sometimes we discharge patients, but it's often about pain control, breathlessness control, symptom control, nausea, vomiting, et cetera, et cetera. Once you're on top of those symptoms, sometimes the other stuff comes in like, oh, this is emotionally really distressing. This is really horrible. I feel tired all the time. I feel frightened. I don't know how to tell my husband. And, and, and you're, then once you've gotten on top of the physical symptoms, sometimes the even more tricky emotional um, aspects come out. And, you know, I, I suppose, did I think I was going to become a palliative me a medicine consultant when I was a medical student? No, I didn't. Um, how did that develop? I suppose over the years, working in, in general medicine, working in elderly care, working in gastroenterology, working in neurology, you kind of de develop, a, you know, your, your skills a little bit, you sort of maybe recognize what you're quite good at and what you're not so good at. And 
I suppose just listening to people, you know, not having a problem going into very high emotion, high conflict situations. I never seem to have a big problem with that and just sort of sat down and let people talk. Um, whereas other doctors really were very frightened of that and really concerned about doing that. Just, you know, that you develop your skills. And so palliative medicine always was quite a, uh, a, a logical next step, I suppose, in, in someone who, I really dithered with my career and thinking about what I was going to do next. So I was you know, stagnant for many years with lots of concerned onlookers, you know, saying, what are you doing with your life? You know, but, but, but I found, <laughs> I think that's, <laughs> um, you know, that that's often, you know, often the case, isn't it? And I think all yeah. of us who are, who are professionals um, are, you know, you start off and you start off with these sort of grand aspirations of your, you know, your degree, I'm going to be a lawyer. Great. You know, crack on. And then the reality hits and you go, there's very little, uh, you know, that, that bears resemblance to sort of the academic to the reality. And, yeah. and, and it's that for me, it was that sort of step change of yeah. working with people and meeting people, and talking to people. And as you say, it's that human side that, you know, go, yeah. hang on, I, you know, I've got I've got a legal toolkit yeah. <laughs> in my in my case. But actually, yeah. I need to learn all these sort of skills of, you know, you know listening and talking and, as you say, head tilt and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or they're there in my case which I get told off about because they said that's not really that sympathetic and, and, and you always knew Helen that you'd be lawyer of the year you always knew that ah. <laughs> <laughs> that that was a genuine surprise oh I was sitting there, sitting there. By the way. That's thank fantastic. you thank you yeah we're um, sitting, there, sitting there on our table and we're like yeah yeah it's fine you know come on get through the speeches you know do the interesting bit and they call my name and I'm like what so that was good fun so yes I mean, not detracting from talking about palliative medicine but just just because everyone here is interested basically was there like a big short list were you like one of one of many and did you uh, think the that? there were three finalists so it was um myself somebody from the local council and somebody from a family law so all all quite diverse um lawyers um yeah. but uh, yeah there we are people are interested in, in you know what i do legal geriatrics <laughs> <laughs> More legal acrobatics, I'd say. Oh, well, indeed. And I think, you know, what, so really talking about these sort of things is really a case of, you know, as you say, it's like, hang on, I'm facing things I've just got no idea about, you know. So it, it, as a lawyer, I sit there and go, well, I can draw up lovely bits of paper and, you know, they're nice and they're legal documents and that's great. But what do they, how do they work in, in the real world? Yeah. And, you know, the ones that obviously you and I've crossed over on, on before are the things like advanced decisions. And, you know, we can sit down and have a nice chat over a cup of tea with somebody and go, well, you know, what, what do you think, you know, is your position on, you know, end of life care? Well, I don't mm -hmm. know. And so really for me, it's like once we've drawn them up and, you know, we've, we've got precedents and we've got fantastic resources in, you know, things like Talk CPR, which we'll come on to in a moment. Um, but actually, do you do you see them in reality? Do, do, do people come to you with these in their medical notes? Uh, yes, I mean, it's sometimes it's, it's getting a bit, it's becoming a bit more frequent. So uh, what I'm really pleased about is that in, in the general hospitals where I work and in the cancer centre as well, we're seeing more lasting powers of attorney for health and welfare, mm -hmm. which, which is really helpful. And every time I see one, I sort of hunt the junior doctors down saying, put it in the front of the notes, get a photocopy, give the, give the original back to the patient and get a photocopy. And, and then you still sometimes find they've they've done that and they've got the lasting power of attorney for for property and i say no no not that one we need the one for health and welfare yeah um and then they go and hunt that one down and put a photocopy in the front of the note which is just a really important document especially if you and you then know, you go through it with with them basically and say okay even if my life is you know um yeah just just the various aspects of who who is there for them basically and what decisions they might make and how big the decisions can be basically so so that's a really good one. That's, that's always been close to my heart in terms of I find that probably of all the advanced care planning, um, that's probably one of the really important ones. Um, advanced decisions to refuse treatment, also, um, also very important, but potentially legally a bit more um, interesting and troublesome in some ways, because I think there was a recent court case where someone had written an advanced decision to refuse treatment and it was quite old by now. And then perhaps there was some evidence that over the years her views on 
that certain things had changed or religious views or whatever, basically. So, uh, yeah, complex sometimes. You might see an advanced decision to refuse treatment and usually that's you know, very clear for a doctor, clear mandate to steer away from, from certain things. But then, you know, as a sort of thinking person, you have sort of maybe doubts and concerns. You want to explore it a bit more with that person. Or, or the relatives and the family, and then doubts start creeping in, basically. So um, I suppose just quickly in summary, I suppose, you know, when you, you said about uh, uh, lawyers and legal teams having having the time and the space, sitting with their clients, having a, a neat sort of 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. appointment with one person where they can talk about a lot of these things. If you saw my my world and some of you on 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 the on the conversation today probably have perhaps work in healthcare or perhaps some so maybe social workers who go into hospitals. I, I often work on this Nightingale wards in in Clandock Hospital where there's like you know twenty four beds next to each other. The only thing that divides it is a curtain. It's really noisy. The the tea trolley goes by. There's someone shouting in the next next bed. Or and and it's. Yeah, having those conversations sometimes in 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 a private setting is is just seems like a very distant world, and you've got junior doctors who having to have these conversations and explore with people what what the issue is. So, I guess you know so, you know I'm I'm connected to a lot of lawyers on Twitter now, and in part that's your fault, Helen. And, <laughs> and 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 they're, they're all great, and they're often interested in advanced care planning. But occasionally, you see the one who maybe makes a quite um, maybe one-sided statement about uh, nurses and doctors and healthcare professionals perhaps that lawyer has only you know has, has sort of heard the sort of relatives and the patient's perspectives basically of it and how awful it was and it's sort of understandable that they might see it that way but I can read between those lines sometimes and I can sort of see uh, I think I know how that miscommunication may have happened and uh, you know before you start throwing stones you know check how, how big the glass house is you know because it, it it can be very difficult sometimes not finding excuses but communication barriers in this topic it's really are. important and you know likewise i mean twitter is a phenomenal resource and you know i've found all sorts of wonderful medics and you know and just learning learn so much learn so much about your side of things and i think you know for me you know in my head in my simplistic world right we've got an advanced decision to review treatment it's a legally binding document there it is you can waive it You've got a power attorney for health where you've given your choices to somebody else because you, they, you think they're going to do the right thing, which is mm. great. Because then at least everybody's got somebody to talk to rather than just a cold piece of paper. Or there's the real cop out. But actually, you know, for a lot, lot of clients, it's comforting, which we do sort of a letter, a, a statement of wishes yeah. and say, look, you know, don't set it in stone. Just see how you feel, but actually just give your family some guidance and, you yeah. know, um, just what's important to you um what do you need and, and yeah. we have lots of that dialogue and actually where where it's good for it's good for us because we've got the time and and you yeah. have it and say look you know i can ask you awkward questions yeah. you can then go and talk to your family preferably over sunday lunch or you know cup of tea or you know um i think it was baroness finley said well, the best time to have an awkward conversation is in a car yes <laughs> he said you know That's you're going point. somewhere there's an end yeah. point you don't have to look at the person yeah I went, oh, I like that. Yeah, it's good, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's really interesting because I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but I've got a um, very young patient at the moment, and um, who I mean, I had lots of conversations with her about this, and she's kind of of a similar view that you know she's living her best life at the moment. She's she's really wanting to sort of um, live life to the maximum, but you know, if you look at her scans, it's very significant disease basically. So anything could happen at any any point, and she was heading up to a, a, a wedding basically and she said you know um i need to talk to my my partner about this and actually we're, we're going to use that opportunity when we're driving when he's driving up there so i'll have a conversation with him then and i said yeah actually the the car conversation you know is brilliant because there's some psychology in that you're not looking directly at each other sort of across the table and sort of you know and and just looking straight ahead um yeah absolutely so can, hmm. Uh, and, and it is and it's you know it's difficult conversations and you know nobody wants to talk about end of life stuff and nobody wants to talk about disasters and you know well we do, we do. Hey. <laughs> like, yeah go on nah. it's good stuff and you know it's, it's good important stuff and I think you know that neatly segues into talk CPR yeah yeah <laughs> nice <laughs> see what I did there yeah you did you did that really well I um, mean yeah so 
I, I for everyone um, in, in in the conversation. So talk CPR and hashtag talk CPR. Do a lot of um, this on, on on Twitter basically. So a few a few many years ago, actually, I had this idea of you know I was having conversations with with patients and their, and their loved ones about why on earth would you want to have a do not attempt CPR decision in your notes or you know why would you have that conversation basically and you know a lot of people think well you know I really don't want to talk about this thank you very much I want to focus on my my chemo and my radiotherapy and various other things but then when you sort of talk about through the sort of low success rates of CPR how incredibly unsuccessful it is for people with say cancer that are spread or people with long-term conditions like uh, you know chronic kidney disease plus other uh, issues on, on, on top of that um, then it's not just like a footballer collapsing on the pitch during the Euros, having CPR and, well, you know, pretty much being fine again a few, a few months later. You kind of sort of see that CPR itself is a selective procedure. It's a, it's a very select, it's, it selects who it's going to work on and who is not going to work on. And so this is something I talk about a lot. And we thought, let's call this talk CPR. So with, with some of my patients, and with some of the carers who had had uh, people that had DNA CPR forms, we sort of said, let's actually turn this around a bit. Let's create some resources and some videos to discuss this. Why on earth would you want a DNR form? You know, the Daily Mail demonizes them. But why on earth, what might be the benefit to this? Why, why might this be potentially a, a good thing? And so we came up with the name Talk CPR. Because so we're talking about CPR and we're talking about the absence of CPR potentially as one procedure, the procedure of many. So um, like my patient Keith, Keith Cass, who doesn't mind being mentioned, the late Keith Cass, who uh, had a DNA CPR form, he had it for about two or three years. He said, I'll have anything, experimental chemo, experimental treatments, this, that, whatever. He had loads of immunotherapy for his cancer. He had lots of radiotherapy, but he had a DNA CPR form pretty much tucked into his shirt all the time. Um, he, uh, yeah, he even went, flew to Barbados a few times, told the stewardesses that he had a DNA CPR form because he didn't want to have any defibrillation on the plane if he did. And have, no called uh, out for the doctors on the plane. <laughs> an event, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that caused a bit of, um, that caused a bit of a stink on the plane. I think they, I think they were a bit, they didn't know what to do really. Um, and then Keith asked me whether the DNA CPR, the Welsh or Wales DNA CPR would be valid in Barbados, to which I said, I don't know, Keith. It's probably an advisory document. I hope they can read my writing on it. Uh, but, but this was something that was, was important to him. And actually, he was someone, he didn't want an ADRT. He didn't want to make lasting power of attorney for health and welfare. Um, and, and so for him, in the list of things, statement of wishes and preferences, the DNA CPR was what he wanted. Uh, he, he didn't want to do any, anything else. So, but yeah, he helped also with the Talk CPR videos. They're on talkcpr.com if you're interested or talkcpr.org.uk. They're also on YouTube. So if you go into YouTube and go into the search engine, type talkcpr, you'll find them all there. And it's healthcare professionals talking about it, patients and, and patient representatives, Alan Buckle and Leslie Radley are on there talking about uh, CPR and DNA CPR and why we would think about it. And we've also got a, a website called advancecareplan.org.uk which we've done um, uh, where there's also patients talking about advanced care planning and DNA CPR and, and why you would sort of consider it. So it takes sort of the narrative of the, the some newspapers basically that sort of say, um, you know, DNA CPR is, is awful and terrible and whatever. And so it turns it around and says, okay, you know, it's not a topic that people m maybe want to talk about. It's a tricky one, but, you know, let's look at both sides of the cat coin. Why might it be useful to have such a form in the notes? And, and you know, why do people sort of have it and consider it? And why do some of my patients come to me and say, I want a DNA CPR form? You know, maybe that gets a bit lost in, in the popular press and the popular, me popular media sometimes. You just want the next big story, the next big scandal, basically. I ah, absolutely. And I completely agree with you. And, you know, I'm increasingly seeing clients and when we're, when we're I'm talking to them about powers of attorney and talking to them about um, advanced decisions, they go, no, I'm already covered. I've got a D you know, I've got my, my CP to DNA CPR with my doctor. I went, great. Excellent. Yeah. 
that's fantastic well done so you, you're comfortable with this element of the conversation so this definitely is trickling through but i can say you know and i will circulate the uh, links at the end of this with with a recording talk cpr is a fantastic resource i mean i have used it so many times with people because it's just like look you know i'm a lawyer you know <laughs> I can go so far, but take it take it from these guys. These guys know what they're talking about. These guys can take you through it. And it's that luxury of time. It's that yeah. luxury of time to be able to do that, isn't it? And, it's, and you know what's so nice about it as well was the multi-professional nature of it. So lots of people contributed to it, patients, carers, representatives, and oncology doctors, uh, resource officers, uh, but also art students. So I, I went down to Falmouth, um, so the, the, some uh, lecturers from Falmouth um, Art College um, got in touch, which is a really good art college in the UK. And um, they said, look, our third year uh, students here, they're looking for a project to do. So we've got 20 of them, they're looking for a project to do. And uh, once a year we have, uh, it's called Moth, which is the uh, an, um, death and dying in art. And we've seen your talk CPR resources and yeah, they, they, we just wondered if we could contribute something for their third year project, basically. So I said, yeah, fantastic. So they kind of brought me down to, to Falmouth. I did a lecture on DNA CPR and advanced care planning. And these really bright young students who asked some really, actually they asked better questions than some of my medical students do. I mean, really intelligent questions. They, they linked it to their own lives and someone that they lost, for instance, and, and then they had to go off for, for six months then and come up with a project. And then I had to be the judge at the end of it, which felt, well, for, well, it, I mean, obviously, you know, you're going to be grateful for anything everyone does, basically. But, um, you know, so and then they produced a stop frame animation video for me, which is also on the Talk CPR website and the YouTube channel. So you can sort of see how, how much work they put into it, basically. So fantastic video have a look and it's even narrated by the art students and they go through the statistics and the numbers and the successes of CPR. And a lot of my patients find that really helpful and really useful and they watch that and they kind of go, okay, yeah, at least it gives me a bit more information now. So we've had the initial conversation, then they go and watch the videos. Sometimes they show the videos to their family or loved ones basically. And the next time I see them, they we're talking from less of sort of hierarchical, it's, 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 it's a more even conversation, a more joined up conversation, because it took me ages to learn about DNA CPR as a, as a, as a medic. Mm -hmm. And I'm expecting these patients to get new into healthcare to understand and suddenly sign up to this kind of concept, basically. No, it takes a little while to get to a similar knowledge level, basically, you know, similar to everyone in here in their jobs as a different knowledge level to me on something and then if i go and see them we have to be brought to a similar level basically and that takes time sometimes and yeah as i said before in healthcare we don't always have the luxury of that time you know if someone comes in at two o'clock in the morning and you know is, is in a terrible state so pushing it further to the beginnings mm -hmm. you know is, is sometimes helpful and i even say nowadays look this might seem like a strange thing to think about now you've just recovered from a pneumonia we've got this long long-term cancer to, to contend with you're feeling a bit better now and you're feeling better and i'm going to talk to you about something when you're feeling worse basically yeah. so you know I, do you want to do the same thing again this time around so you've come into hospital into a at two in the morning with a terrible pneumonia you've given you antibiotics it's probably on the background of your cancer that this has happened and your metastatic spinal cord compression and you've developed this pneumonia would you want to do the same thing again? And the patient might say, yeah, actually, it's okay. I mean, it wasn't nice, but at least you got rid of the pneumonia. Or they might say, oh, you know, no, thanks. I want to go home and maybe the GP can prescribe some oral antibiotics, but that's all I want to try, basically, and then just keep me at home or, or you know, maybe the hospice or whatever, basically. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm not interested in, in, in that whole shebang happening again. But then you can go through all the different treatments that might come up in future and are on offer and, and have a think about it. Now, this is difficult. This is really, really hard. And I've actually um, put out a few tweets in, in, in the last few days about advanced care planning and the complexity of it, because you're asking someone to imagine multiple different tricky scenarios. Actually, CPR is actually quite an easy one in, in some ways from, from, for me nowadays, because it's very specific and defined. Whereas, you know, you're asking a patient to decide, you know, would you in future want to have chemotherapy? Well, I don't know. 
would you in future want to have antibiotics and be rushed into hospital at two in the morning? No, I don't want that, but I would consider it. You know, so some people maybe make it a bit too easy and say, do you want to go into hospital again? And that's a bit too simplistic because, you know, if you say, I never want to go into hospital again. Yeah, okay, you might have a, a cancer and advanced disease, but what if you just fell down the stairs and broke your wrist, you know, and it's really painful? Well, yeah, then I would want to go to a hospital. Ah, okay, fine. So again, it's not as simple as right to do not hospitalize charter of some sort. It, it, there's so many multiple complexities in it that it, yeah, advanced care planning is a, is a real, real challenge. And I don't think we shouldn't do it. I think it's fantastic, but we should also know its, its, its borders and its barriers and, and what, what inhibits it a little bit. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think, you know, so something I sort of I'm talking to people and, and talking about aging process and, you know, and getting older and getting ill and multiple comorbidities and chronic illness and stuff. I said, you know, well, traditionally it was childhood, adulthood, old age. Hmm. We're now moving into extreme old age, which is sort of uncharted waters. <laughs> yeah. And we've got all this complexity of people, you know, and my, my parents, classic examples, parents, classic baby boomers, um you know i was um, going to say baby boomers, boomers just now, but you've done it now yeah they don't want to die classic baby boomers <laughs> and their parents yeah you know, not alive anymore my grandparents were were sort of you know um miners from the valleys you know didn't expect to live that long hmm. <laughs> lived through the second world war you know been down in the coal mine saw all sorts of horrors you, you know and, and nobody nobody's lived by beyond like you know 60. <laughs> So my grandparents found themselves like in their late 80s and their 90s. And, you know, hang on, what, what's all this about? You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, my parents went, hang on, we we as baby boomers, classic baby boomers, mm -hmm. as a generation, we're all looking at each other going, hang on, we're looking after our parents. We never have, they didn't have to do this for theirs. And it's been a complete eye opener. Yeah. It's been a, such an eye opener, both for my grandparents and so who were in their 80s and their 90s when they died and you know all power to nhs wales who did a sterling job with all of them uh -huh. um but actually the dialogue was then really important for my parents and their contemporaries and they've started to go hang on <laughs> yeah we're now talking hang on what if we get you know all these multiple comorbidities we're not dropping down dead nobody's yeah. dropping down dead anymore which is great yeah. but actually that's quite that's quite an eye-opener yeah. Um, and you know, I, I clearly, I clearly have signed my parents, parents up to do absolutely everything. So that's fine. <laughs> I had no choice because <laughs> I said, yeah. "Don't think I'm not. Don't think you know. I'm, I'm looking after this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> without the appropriate bits of paper." So mm. you know, you know. But it, it for, for them, it was a genuine sort of, gosh. And my mother, you know, retired from work and then ended up as a full time carer. Mm. Yeah. And she like really sort of found this as a, as a, as a shock, yeah. and so. That dialogue is is increasingly important for people because they're seeing it now, not only in in sort of younger people, sort of with the as you say cancers and, and what have you, but also the other stuff that end of life stuff that surprising stuff. And you know the big one I think that we're seeing and we all know about is increases in dementia, which then has mm. mass knock knock on effect on capacity. And then let's bring in the mental capacity act, which everybody loves. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> doctors you know go just no just i haven't got time for this <laughs> and you know i love the mental capacity act and you know i'm a real like legal nerd at this point because i think as a piece of legislation it's fantastic it's really empowering it's really about moving away from this idea of um well i i like this um historically if you look at the magna carta you used to split people into e either imbeciles or lunatics <laughs> imbeciles you know they, they yeah. you know, couldn't really help themselves they were born like that or they had an injury or lunatics it was temporary temporary the moon yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and i'm like okay we've moved away from the we've moved away from the um wording <laughs> good yeah but actually it is understanding actually we've got people who aren't going to be able to get beyond a point because of an injury or an illness um yeah. a learning disability or a learning difficulty um, and then people who perhaps have fluctuating capacity, you know, yeah. and that, that's hard. I mean, yeah. that has got to be so hard from your perspective. It, it is. I mean, I've just had it this week, basically. So, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we, we, we've been looking after a, a gentleman who had a deprivation of liberty, sa liberty safeguard in place, basically. And perhaps we've been looking him after him a bit too well, because actually, I think he's got capacity now to make his decisions, basically. So um, capacity was a bit 
diminished beforehand and he was not really answering the the questions um in a sort of coherent way um mm -hmm. uh, when we asked him about safety of being at home and he's alone he doesn't have anyone basically but 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 now with some fluids and some good hospital food <laughs> and you know antibiotics and various other things I, i'm i'm you know I, my tuesday assessment was no this guy has got capacity now um and and so the junior doctor said to me oh okay so basically we just have to get rid of the dolls don't we and i said yeah kind of uh, i mean it might be worth doing another capacity assessment this afternoon to see how fluctuant it is but then what do you do that is the first capacity assessment that you've got bingo he's got capacity to make that decision and i'm happy with that is that the one that yeah. explodes the dolls or would you wait a bit and see if the evening lunar lunatism <laughs> comes in basically <laughs> Sundowning. yeah and then he then he loses that 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 ability to, to to be coherent and and retain the information as well basically so and and i and i guess there's some people who would say no absolutely he's he he, he passed one capacity assessment that's the doll's gone boom and someone else might say oh be a bit careful because he might make a big you know decision now that he's going home and you must put everything in place for him and on the day that he leaves he's all over the place again can't look after himself and then you, you you get a phone call from the community saying you know we found him you know yeah. uh and then you kind of think oh my god you know should we have let him go in the first place uh, you know you, you sometimes feel like a, a prison guard and then other times you feel like amnesty international and you want to bring them together you know yeah i you know and you know it, it is the most complicated things i mean dolls is is you know i'm aware of dolls and it's not something i do it is, it is a slight mysterious thing and i've got very good lawyers i know and i go when doll stuff comes up i go can i just you know can i bring you in and, and, and do this stuff because you know just quite frankly slightly mystifies me yeah, yeah. but yeah i mean you know nobody wants to be kept yeah. against their will of course they don't and actually again this is where the law goes this is the right thing because yeah. none of us should be falsely imprisoned anywhere you know i'd hate to be locked up somewhere not allowed the, the, the one thing I, I i do drum into the the doctors and nurses that i work with is just just because we think someone is making a daft decision doesn't mean we can suddenly um, use the instruments of, of, of law and deprivation against them, basically. So really, really important message days that that, that that doesn't become a sort of culture in a way. And I think it has been potentially a culture in the past in, in, in the NHS and social care setting where you're dealing with 40, 50 patients a day and you just can't cope with the massive influx. So you kind of think, oh, dolls this, whatever, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we have to be so careful there. So I'm I'm kind of, I have more the Amnesty International hat on most of the time and sort of say, no, no, he's made that decision. It's, 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 it's daft. And yes, I'm fearful that we'll get a phone call from the community saying that he's been found, you know, um, and hasn't looked after himself and no one's been there to look after him. But what can we do? You know, it's, yeah. It's that, it is that, you know, we must assume people have capacity until shown otherwise. And I think that's that, you know, to, you know, that is a fundamental part of the Mental Capacity Act. Yeah. And, you know, it can be translated into, do you know what, mm. just because I wouldn't do it doesn't mm. mean that they can't. And just, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a stubborn old person, you yeah. know, and I, I, I had an uncle um, who was absolutely adamant that he didn't want to have any treatment didn't want to he wanted to live in a certain way he wants to live his life in a certain way and all he wanted to do was sit home and listen to Beatles records and we're like that's fine <laughs> and my dad used to go just really just gets just why why does he want to live like that I went let him yeah. <laughs> leave him be and yeah. he went you know what actually why, why shouldn't I you know and you know he lived his life out and he was very happy and you know he lived but it was not it wasn't a life that anybody else understood yeah it was his life you yeah. know and, and you know he had the most astonishing collection of vinyl and and, and stamps we've ever seen yeah. um and yeah and the rest of us were like we wouldn't live that up mm. but you can and yes you're not looking after yourself and you're not perhaps you know eating new greens and you know taking your medication as you should be but actually we have to leave you be yeah and, um, and take the criticism on the chin later if someone says oh he was found and no one of his bloody relatives to, yeah. and interest no it wasn't like that we just let him live his life you know yes. and he made he made those choices so yeah the critique afterwards can can come in and especially in healthcare you know um you know the the, the nurses in the hospital are often fearful of you know getting the label of unsafe discharge 
Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, no, but it's a real concern actually on, on the wards, basically. Oh, no, they've called back. It's been an unsafe discharge and they get all, into all sorts of trouble for that. And yeah, and then you can sort of see why why the culture develops of let's not make it an unsafe discharge. And suddenly you've got 16 healthcare professionals who in a row have to make a decision. Yes, 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 yes. The discharge is going to be safe. You're going to get one or two who say, oh, no, their assessment was a bit dodgy, yeah. you know. So then they stay in and they don't want to stay in. And I say, no, I, I can take the stairs. Don't worry about it. I'll find, I'll, I'll shuffle my way up on my bum, basically. Yes. Okay, yeah, but but someone is, someone will talk them down because you've got 16 healthcare professionals in a row talk to you that it's unsafe to go. You know, by number 11, you're worn down, basically. Yeah, uh, I, 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 it is, it must, it's incredibly hard, isn't it? I mean, I say you know, my uncle um, was deeply eccentric even before he got ill. I mm. mean, you know, you know, and, and that, that, that continued. Mm. And it was it was that point it was that pinch point where he'd gone into hospital and was coming out and where did he live and this that and the other and it was a real deep breath moment for the family yeah 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 <laughs> and you know we work with the health professionals we're like look look you know it's tough out there and yeah. you know no no more never more so than in, in this last sort of uh, 18 months or so yeah. i think we haven't even really sort of touched on um and sort of on the pandemic um we've not used know. the c word yet that's right no. oh <laughs> Uh, I mean, you, you know, uh, uh, obviously sort of nobody knows what the outcome of this is, but obviously at early doors of the pandemic the, the, mm -hmm. and talking about CPR, yeah. that was frightening. That must have been so frightening for you as, as, a, as a profession. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> lots of things go through my head now. So I, I've, I've got the sort of memories of, of the pandemic and obviously it's not good. And you kind of, you, um, I mean, some enduring memories, basically, that I'll probably never get out of my brain again, but just people did dying alone in hospital rooms basically you know and i hope no one in this meeting has had someone in that situation because you know um but it's it's a pandemic of grief as well because perhaps all of us have lost someone through through the pandemic for because of covid or as a result of covid and it, it's yeah it's just it was a pandemic of empty hospital chairs no visitors i was praying for the visitors to come back just because they I'd only realized then how much they bring being with the person, you know, in the hospital setting. But I saw people dying alone in, in various settings and in, in, in the hospitals and hospices and in, in rooms by themselves. And initially you're frightened to go into the room with your full PPE because you're afraid of getting it. and You don't know what the consequences are going to be. And then you're frightened of leaving the room because no one's going to come in again for another 30, 40 minutes or so. And the person's just alone and just seems wrong. You know, and, and yes, we set up lots of videos and laptops and we got in lovely community donations of tablet computers and we hooked it onto the Wi-Fi so people could communicate with the outside world and their loved ones. We even had a gentleman say, say mass upstairs for the rest of his family and they set up the laptop on his usual seat at home and, 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 and things like that were, were, were great. But then imagine, you know, having that laptop on all the time live, basically, and then witnessing the demise of your person in the hospital in, and oh my God, what do we do? He's really struggling with his breathing. And, you know, so some, some real horrible stories really that um, I'll never get in, out of my mind, I think. And, and, and then the added concept of, you know, you've got, you've got someone who's come in, they're unwell, you know, really unwell with COVID pneumonitis and uh, they may survive, they may not survive really really very very unclear and maybe they've got a long-term condition here or there maybe we've got some background diabetes and a bit of kidney disease and moderate heart failure but you wouldn't have expected them in even at the age of 71 or 72 to to deteriorate and even if they'd gotten influenza or something like that you wouldn't have you know you would have pulled everything out to kind of help them and, and help them improve and suddenly you've got this overwhelming disease where it's really on a knife edge and you have to tell people they could die, they might die. Mm -hmm. And I think CPR probably wouldn't work if, 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 it, if it happens. Mm -hmm. but, but, but then you've got people who, who pulled out again of that situation. So you, on the one hand, you call the relatives on the phone because you couldn't get them in and said, I think tonight might be the night. And then the next day, that person's still been there. And, and then over the weeks, they've stabilized. And then you kind of have to tear up the DNA CPR form again or whatever advanced care plans you put in place or TEP forms, treatment escalation plans, because you had pegged it against a specific episode in time, you know? Of course. And yeah. then, of course, most people did that, but maybe some people kind of went, oh, maybe they didn't 
or the getting rid of the DNA CPR form. So that traveled with the patient. And now there's some patients with perhaps with DNA CPR forms that were pegged against a specific moment in time when they were literally at death's door. Yeah. Uh, and, and now that needs to be torn up and, and taken away again. So it, it was that, you know, sometimes when you've got someone with really advanced metastatic cancer, you realize that if there's an end point somewhere, you might not be great at prognosticating it. You might not know if it's two years, three years, six months, uh, two months to whatever, basically. But when, when the moment comes and the slow deterioration starts happening over 48 hours or 72 hours, then CPR wouldn't be appropriate, wouldn't be wanted, and comfort measures are much better. Um, but if you're in that situation where there's constant fluctuations and constant changes and it's down to one massive overwhelming virus viral infection then you're sort of in a, a more of a, a, a limbo land as such and then longer term advanced care planning doesn't doesn't function in the same way as it would have for the patients that you would maybe traditionally think about basically in the advanced care planning scenario don't know if that yeah. makes sense no oh, completely and i think you know sort of i mean this terrifying learning curve mm. you know unfolding over the days and the weeks and the months yeah um and, 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 you know, and it was like a slow burner as well because we had all this data from italy coming through and we're thinking oh my goodness this is coming to our shores very very soon basically yeah. and then here in wales we sort of started hearing in london the itus filling up basically and lot corresponding with those people and we were sending forms back and forth and i've been corresponding uh with clinicians in italy basically and they say do this do that and have this ready and have this ready basically make sure you've got good stocks of these and these drugs basically yeah and you're kind of thinking, oh, my goodness. And then, uh, I don't know, everyone remembers the, the, the lockdowns, I'm, I'm sure. But it was just, um, it was strange because as a key worker, I was driving around, basically driving from one hospital to the next. And streets were empty. It was just like, crikey, this is like some sort of nuclear Armageddon, basically. And yeah. completely empty streets. There was no other cars around. And now it's total chaos out in Cardiff. And I mean, I don't know if there's anyone calling in from Cardiff at the moment, but you can't, it's bumper, bumper to bumper at the moment. And, but it was just empty. Everything was just empty. Everyone was staying at home. And it was just such a strange, strange, I'll never forget it. It's just a strange, strange time. A very yeah. strange experience because um, talking about Italy. So I ended up in a funeral um, for somebody and there was some Italian family there. And mm. it was the end of February. And we were like, What's, what's going on in Italy? They went, oh, we're okay because we're south of the red line. Because, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's Milan and we're okay. We're in Pisa. And we went, okay, fair enough. So we, so we were keep, keeping in touch with them uh, as family members. And then I went to um, a medico legal dinner yeah. with lots of, you know, sort of retired doctors. And they went, yeah, it's not flu. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was the, that was the point I went, yeah. okay. Okay, so they were like, "This is this is not normal. This is not normal stuff." And you know, and as you say, it's it's that sort of watching it unfold. And for me, mm. Twitter was amazing because it was actually you know spotting what you guys were saying early. I was able to, as you say, sort of get in touch with people and go, "Look, this isn't you know, don't wait for the government." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but... Things aren't fun. No, no, no. I I don't know. It, it, yeah, it was just extreme, and uh, you obviously you can't give too much away because obviously you're bound by patient confidentiality and you you also i suppose if i had illustrated such stories at the time then the relatives might have recognized their their loved one basically in that and might have been even more distressed but i suppose yeah the staff were just trying to do everything to to be with people and i remember just on some of the wards in Tlandok, they were lovely the staff they were just really trying to get everyone to to go in but they were frightened as well because they didn't want to catch it as well so that's the thing you kind of go in full ppe basically you're sort yeah. of, sort of a, a human being that is only visible but via the eyes you know and there was a visor in front of those so if the light shone on you, you couldn't even see those so just lots of different things like we stuck photos of ourselves onto our ppe kit sort of laminated ones so you could wipe them down every single yeah. time and just it was just insane i mean it was really really crazy um and perhaps there's some healthcare professionals in, 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 in the forum today who, who, who went through something similar. But uh, yeah, and then, and then transmitting that. And then, you know, people trying to come into hospital to film that there was nothing going on business as usual, basically, which is really <laughs> yeah. strange. Um, but yeah, you know, 
to send them packing obviously and <laughs> well quite quite right too and i think you know i think you, you say it's that it's that human element isn't it and everything we've talked about we've talked about so far and we'll open the floor in a moment to anybody who wants to ask anything it's about that human element you know you're talking about people in times of great distress whether they've just had a diagnosis and you know or whether they've had that second diagnosis or they've had the terminal diagnosis and, and, and all those stages all those stages that you're going through as you say you, you know whether you're working if you're working obviously in the cancer ward you've got people with sort of yeah. all the problems that go with it and then you throw on something like covid or pneumonia on top of it well, you know that's a whole different thing I, I must i must say i just just to add sorry Helen, but i would just to add um one of the things it did do at the time was it kind of got our thinking far more acute and things that we dithered about for many many years such an uh, such as an all wales advanced decision to refuse treatment for patients basically things like an all Wales advanced statement, things like uh, a record of best interest decision forms, which thank you very much you got involved with, um, suddenly became, right, we have got to do this now. We've got two months to do this. We need to get this out there. So patients who've got really specific fears, wishes, and, and concerns mm -hmm. can have a plethora of NHS Wales document that are out there. They can take those and use those. And they're informed about lasting power opportunity for health and welfare. We, we need to get this done now because there's never been a better time to get this over the line. And we got that over the line. So I chair the Advanced and Future Care Planning Strategy Group for Wales, which is in charge of advanced decisions, ADRTs, DNA CPR forms. And we produced this plethora of forms with patient involvement, basically, with guidance notes, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got them all in one place now. And you know what? It was done during COVID, during the acute times, but we only need to make minor changes now and i think without COVID, that would have taken us probably five years longer to, to 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 get in place so some good things also happened in terms of the usual bureaucratic processes within the nhs which sometimes serve purposes but also really slow things down and i can see the legal world tends to move much faster than than us us lot actually that that helped us speed it along a bit and got the, the thinking more acute which is uh, you know if that's if that's that's a that's a fantastic positive right isn't it you know to, to be able to drive that through and to be able to drive that you know not only assistance for your patients being empowered but also your staff because i think you know it, it is getting hung up and caught up in all that sort of plethora of bureaucracy and am i doing the right thing and you know do i how many how many capacity assessments do i need for somebody who's just being awkward yeah 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 <laughs> and it, it also means we've got a plethora of documents and guidance notes in place and they're already in place and now we can really focus on on this sort of thing so I've, every week at the moment i'm doing one or two talks about advanced care planning and dna cpr and uh, statements of wishes of preferences lasting power of attorney and 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 so i can i can then say look at the re resources the wales.nhs.uk forward slash afcp and if you get to that then you can see all the resources that are there the infrastructure is now in place and now we can really focus on the education element whereas before and it was always well we need to educate first and then get the resources and see what they are or do you get the resources first and then educate people and it was that constant sort of which one starts first yeah. you actually get the ball rolling no we've got it in place now not going to change that that stays there and we do a yearly review of the documents but we now really focus on the education of all staff patients carers that they know it's there now so my colleague in the motor neuron disease clinic basically know, now knows that the resources are there a lot of her clients will say, I would like, to, I've heard about ADRTs, I want to fill one in, is there an all Wales one? And she can say, yeah, got that there, it's even got guidance notes, they're bilingual, you know, you can read them in Welsh as well if you want to, and it's then, it's, it's all in place, and we haven't got that chicken and egg situation anymore. Which is phenomenal, and I think, you know, you clearly are just leading the way with, with this driving it forward and, and giving that back which I think is, is phenomenal and, and I think you know I, and I am pleased if that's come out of co if that's come out of the pandemic then you know fantastic so I'm going to open up the floor if anybody wants to ask any questions uh, if not as you can tell Mark and I will talk forever <laughs> <laughs> actually Emily and Dawn Richards had their video camera on which I thought was really nice actually because um because I, I was it's nice to see see people in in in, in the chat this as is. well yeah. Equally, people are also well trained in terms of keeping it off because sometimes it <laughs> messes with the, the the Zoom connection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. You know, that, that's that. That's we live. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got anything they want to they want to say to Mark? There we go. So we have Moira Anderson Hill. 
I wonder if you're concerned that a number of ADRTs are being written without being specific enough to guide doctors in such a way that they are confident to follow them, yet the writer is not aware of the ambiguity. Yeah, I, I am concerned about that sometimes, but then an ADRT is a very bespoke individual document. So I suppose uh, we've got the guidance notes to go with it and have a little look perhaps if you want to add the wales.nhs.uk forward slash AFCP website where the all Wales advanced decision to refuse treatment document is, is located. And then perhaps look at the guidance notes. I mean, I suppose there's only so much we can do, but then with the resources, I mean, often I would say, a patient might say to me, look, I'm thinking about writing an advanced decision to refuse treatment. Could we, could you give me a bit of guidance or could we even write it together? Or, you know, and, and then it's a sort of, okay, maybe you want to focus on this. And our statement of wishes and preferences document that we've brought on the same website, um, actually is quite it, it, it's quite clinical it points you in a certain direction okay so it says okay these are the procedures that might come up in conversations so you can you can blend it a little bit and uh, yeah I, I, I it's, it's it's a blend of things but yes it, it is a concern but again it's a it's a consultation and i suspect as, as 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 lawyers the lawyers in the group sometimes may have to push people in a certain direction when they're sitting with them in a, in a room when they're writing a will or something like that or a lasting power of attorney you kind of have to say okay may you may want to think about this um yeah again it's that knowledge hierarchy thing isn't it and i i knowledge hierarchy that's my that, I'm, I'm taking that <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I really like it. It's like you know, because yeah. we all, we're all, wherever our field, we're all like, yeah. Well, this is all just in my head now. Yeah, <laughs> Helen, I think um, uh, Eleni has raised her hand in a oh. in a in a yes. manual way. Yes. Yes. Yeah, hi, Eleni. Hi. Uh, hello, Mark. I wanted to get your views on um, advanced care planning. Um, so, uh, as you said, it's very complex to mm. have these discussions, and it took you years to train, to have very good discussions on CPR, advanced care planning is even more complicated. So I think that people don't understand what advanced care planning is, perhaps. It's and, complex. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I sometimes don't understand it. <laughs> so, and some of us think that perhaps um, the, something needs to change. So we should be perhaps moving away from advanced care planning to something else. Have you got any views on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's been a few editorials recently on this and, and some people just think advanced care planning is doomed. Um, and they think it's too complex. How can you, I mean, they, they critique about five different factors. And I, I, I laid some of them out in a, in a tweet recently. Um, some of the concerns I share, you know, how how exactly how exactly can I know now that in the future, if I've fallen off my bike and I've injured my head, I'm in a sort of vegetative state of some sort, that how I would feel at that point in time. How if, if you ask me now, Alini, to make a decision about whether I want an artificial feeding uh, regimen commenced or not, I would say, oh, I don't know actually. I'm not sure about that. You know, I'm really difficult to know probably veering on no, but like a firm answer in an ADRT or advanced care planning document, not, not, not so sure about that one. But with the critics, I would say to them, um, when I started as a doctor in the year 2000, uh, I mean, it was like zero advanced care planning, really. I mean, a, a little bit. I mean, I think advanced care planning is a natural process that some experienced uh, clinicians, sometimes even inexperienced clinicians will naturally fall into. You can you can call it rainbow planning if you want. You can call it you know yellow wallpaper planning. You can call it advanced care planning. Whatever you call it, it'll always happen to some degree uh, with 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 the interaction in healthcare and and the, with the legal profession as well. And that's a good process. It can be very good. It's about the conversations, good conversations, good planning forward. You but the fact that some people critique, well, you can't ever do it perfectly. Well. If you look at the website I just mentioned, the AFCP website, there's lots of imperfection there. It has to be improved over the years. If we don't make a start somewhere, we don't make incremental improvements, basically. And I think there's already been loads of incremental improvements. If now you say the critics say, oh, get rid of advanced care planning, 
it feels like the the goal line in the future is somewhere visible and we're just saying oh no let's just forget about it but we've come we've come this far already so and perhaps i'm being too glass half full they're being glass half empty they're right to some degree i'm right to some degree but i think the critique is is, is too harsh for me you know advanced care planning big umbrella term so much stuff that you can critique so much but you know we got to start somewhere we need to improve by increments and maybe the future will hold that you eleni and, and and me will have like little video qr codes you know tattooed invisibly on our foreheads and then when we go into healthcare boom qr code and there's a little video that describes this is the sort of person that i am you know i'm you know like this and that and i don't like this and that and i can give the doctors an impression even that is perhaps too vague to some degree but you have some patients who say to me absolutely wouldn't want a feeding tube absolutely wouldn't want ect or something like that from the psychiatrists again you know or they might sort of say you know yes i'd be up for everything really and I, as a doctor if you know that that's that's better than being faced with the unconscious patient who you don't know at all I think, yeah, I think it's answer. easier. It's easier. It's easier to tear something down than build it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. And you can call it what you want to. Now, at, at the moment, advanced care planning is being critiqued. Yeah. Okay. I understand a lot of the criticisms, but you know, if you get rid of it, you're not going to get rid of it. It's still going to happen. You know, good clinicians are still going to talk to people about their future wishes and what they might want. Um, and then someone will come up with another name. At the moment, we're toying with the name future care planning in Wales. Uh, because advanced care planning position, definition of the, the, the Lancet white paper is um, planning with patients who are capacitors. And we went, oh, okay, but there's a lot of planning that happens with people who don't have capacity or have fluctuating capacity. So what do we do? And some of the sort of people who are a bit more bureaucratic in NHS world said, oh, you can't call that advanced care planning anymore. So we decided as a group, we'll call it future care planning as an umbrella term. So you often will see us mentioning advanced and future care planning because we're chucking in the extra Lack, lack, lack of capacity or fluctuant capacity elements as well when we're for instance writing records of best interest decision, best interests decisions documents for instance where we're consulting lots of relatives of about what that person might have wanted in this situation basically i think it, it, you know the comments in the box it, it's about challenging conversations whether they're challenging conversations in a, in a room or in a car or across a boardroom you, you know i think it's keeping that dialogue open and yeah I, I think you know not getting hung up on the bureaucracy of precise words um you know is important and actually if we need to use for future let's let's do that we can start a movement <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mark. That's absolutely brilliant. I cannot recommend enough following Mark on Twitter. And, uh, you know, there are some seriously lively uh, dialogues going on. And I've learned a huge amount and I will continue to learn um, as I sort of uh, pay attention to what, what you guys are up to. Um, I will circulate the recording and I will also uh, circulate details of uh, all the marks mentioned uh, the links so we you know, get, do do get stuck in do have a look at them and if you are talking to people just use them they're fantastic I mean it's made such a difference to my clients when I've been talking to them going you know take it from somebody who knows <laughs> so a huge thank you Mark and um, yes thank you very much for coming and uh, Mark no doubt we'll catch up again soon fantastic and nice to see some familiar faces as well Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.